nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. Hey everybody, it's Amanda with Dev Express, and welcome to our Thursday live stream on Twitch and on YouTube. Hey Arik, how are you doing? Doing great. Better than great, in fact. Oh, why so? Well, uh, there's a there's two of us here at Dev Express, me and Paul Usher. We're kind of Mac fanatics. We have an, an illness, uh, and uh, it's been a journey these last few years, going fully cross-platform. So that means that the announcement last year, I think it was last year, maybe it was six months ago, uh, Microsoft announced that uh, Visual Studio for Mac was getting the ax. And so that was kind of a big blow to both me and Paul. Um, <laughs> Paul has found other solutions. We haven't had to go to the dark side and, and use uh, JetBrains Writer. We don't want to dip in those waters. Oh, wow. But we found that actually VS Code is really surprisingly versatile. Uh, and the uh, that's kind of a, a shocker uh, to us because a lot of what we do uh, and our customers do uh, isn't Visual Studio proper. Uh, so hearing that VS Code is not just good enough, but actually really, really um, an amazing tool when it comes wow. to editing code and you know having a full-blown IDE. So it's not just a text editor, it's actually a full-blown environment for building line of business applications. Uh, and Part of that is that uh, if you go to our, our blog posts, uh, we, we do talk about kind of this new extension that we have, and I recommend taking a look at it. It's actually something that Paul talks about. It's called .NET Meteor, and uh, it's actually uh, contributed to and made by us, uh, but you can actually use our free uh, MAUI controls and use this uh, inside of our MAUI applications. The only proviso I want to give here is that our free Maui component library is specifically targeting iOS and Android. So this is not a component library for desktop applications. So okay. um, if you can't get desktop to work using these components, it's by design. It's not That's not the correct platform you should be using. Um, but uh, if you're interested in that at all, I highly recommend giving this uh, a shot because a lot of the features that Microsoft was excitedly announcing a couple years ago, exclusive to Visual Studio, are now available uh, with this extension in VS Code. So that, yeah, so that that includes uh, the ability uh, to do a hot reload. Uh, so when you're editing XAML views, you could go ahead and actually. Uh, live preview your changes, and you could also get uh, simulator and debugging support as well, as you probably expect. But uh, beyond that, actually, I, I'm not very much a, a mobile guy myself. What I was really excited to hear is that we finally have a way for you to actually use the report designer um, natively in macOS. And actually, we did talk about this, so uh, it's kind of a little bit difficult to find, but if you were paying attention, you would have noticed that we silently, um, un without really much ceremony, have released a, a preview um, extension, a, a preview release, um, the CTP of this particular extension, and it's the report designer for VS Code, and we're going to go over it today. Um, so a, a few kind of steps you're going to have to take if you're going to be using this. Um, so let's uh let's first uh well before i go get into kind of the data environment i'm talking about um let me go ahead and uh, uh let's uh let's go ahead and one moment uh let's create a new window here for us and let's go and dip into vs code itself so before i even do that uh, i actually do want to mention kind of what environment I'm working in, how my .NET tools look like. So I did mention before that I like using the, the latest and greatest version I can get. Um, so basically, I uh, have a, a set of sources that maybe you don't get in your, your .NET. So if you got, go to .NET NuGet list source, you'll see all the NuGet feeds that you're subscribed to. In my case, I have one extra one that probably you don't have, which is called Local DX. And I, by hand, basically populated this folder. Um, and if you're curious at all what this folder has in it, 
Uh, it's basically a set of packages from our uh, installer. So on Windows, I, I actually got the full installer and uh, I was using the, uh, the alpha version of the next major release and I just put everything here. So I just never have to ever um, go online to pull things from NuGet if I need to use uh, the latest and greatest. I've gone ahead and disabled that for this session. And what I've actually gone ahead and enabled and said is, is feed number three, which is what you're going to have access to as well if you, you, you're you a paying customer or if you are on a trial basis. Um, and again, I'm going to have to nuke this uh, um, API feed key because I've now made it public, but it's, it's okay. <laughs> I've Four times the charm, I guess. But anyway, my point is that with this, we're going to actually be using 23.1 today. And the reason for that is that when you're using reports and you're using our uh, other libraries, uh, it's generally best practice to version everything on the same version. And since we haven't officially released 23.2, I recommend sticking to the stable release for now. And uh, around next week, when, when 23.2 goes live and becomes, you know, next generally built. Week. Yeah. You don't say. Yeah, generally available, uh, likely next week. We don't make strong guarantees in, in this business, but uh, <laughs> it's a, it's a, almost a sure thing, as sure as things get. Uh, so what uh, I'm doing here is I'm making sure everything is versioned roughly the same, and I don't think we're going to run into any problems. But the problem is that if you write a report, and if you use a reporting engine in the past, you know this, if you write a report in a version of DevExpress libraries that's different than the application you're loading it into, all bets are off. You might, you know, use something like a, a complex XR control that, you know, got introduced in a later version that's not available in the the assemblies that you are loading at runtime. And it's not, it's not good. So my point is that generally you could sidestep all those issues by just getting your versioning right from the start. Um, so let's take a look at kind of what options I have, because if you um, you kind of have the option of installing um, the Div Express templates um, piece by piece. So some people may uh, only install Maui. Some people may install some of the Blazor reports and WebAssembly features. Let's take a look at what I have on this particular machine. So .NET new list, and I'm, I'm going to find everything that's DX related because that's dead giveaway it's dev express related so I, I do have the ability to create maui um, applications i'm not really terribly interested in mobile so we're not going to dip into that but what i am interested in is um, our blazer options um, and specifically let's go ahead and go full bore and do WebAssembly. why not so this is that last template here so i'm going to do a dot net uh, new uh, dx dot blazer and forgive me for it being a long template reporting web assembly. Okay, no typos. Wow, it's a first. Very and uh, I'm going to call it, let's say, DX Blazor Reports. Let's say uh, I think I already have like a bunch of others. So let's go ahead and create a new one. And uh, if it succeeds, I want to go into this particular folder. So this should give us a starter reporting application in WebAssembly, and we're already in that folder. So let's go into VS Code now. So I'm opening VS Code, and let's go ahead, and I need to maybe navigate directly to it. So there, there it is. And let's go ahead and make this full screen for you. Uh, and uh, let's open the terminal to verify that, yeah, this is where I'm expecting it to be. So. I guess first let's talk about the extension that we kind of expect you to have. So we don't we don't uh, necessarily need you to have much, but you do need to have something called Dev Express Report Designer. So here it is, Dev Express VS Code Report Designer. Be sure to install this, and I'm on the pre-release version. It looks like so, um, which is fine if you want to do that. Um, so let's go ahead and uh, basically this is going over kind of what to expect. But before we, we touch into that, we're not really gonna make use of it immediately. What I'm gonna go ahead and do is just run this project and see what we get from our .NET CLI. That is when we run the template, what do we see? Hey, Arg. 
Yeah. I have a, a question that popped up on YouTube. Uh, sorry, didn't catch that. How do we get these templates? So if you go to uh, our documentation, we have an instruction set for kind of how you go ahead and install from the CLI. So if you want to, for example, go and build reporting applications, and I think if you just type in CLI.net, do a full search. Uh, let's, here we go, use .NET CLI. And uh, I think this is gonna, yeah, this is, so the .NET, that loaded just at the right, wrong moment, but the .NET new command has uh, an install parameter that you can pass in, and then you pass in the name here. Uh, so, so .NET new install, devexpress dot, devexpress dot, dot .NET, dot web, dot project templates. And you don't need the, the version specifier if you don't want it. Um, the one thing you need to do before you do this is uh, you need to have the NuGet feed. In Windows, if you run our installer at least one time, you do already have our NuGet feed. If you haven't done it yet, uh, the way you add our NuGet feed is if you go to nuget.devexpress.com. And this is basically, if you're not going to be running our installer, you have to do this manually. So you go to obtain feed URL. You take this thing, you copy it like I did, and then you do... Uh, something like a, let's get this at the top of the window. You do a .NET, a new get, I believe, source add, um, or sorry, add source. So verb and then the thing. And then the URL and then the name of whatever you want to call it. So you'll call it like a DX online, uh, let's say last, because I'm going to have it show up as my fourth feed. It looks like I'm not allowed to add more. I'm not allowed to reuse the same feed, but I've already added it basically. Um, so if you go to, again, .NET NuGet, list my sources, I have all the feeds, including that last one, that, that exact API key. Um, so that API key is going to let you go ahead and do things like a .NET uh, new install and then the template name. So the template name is that long thing that I was talking about here in this example. So it's called that long thing is devexpress.net.web.projectTemplates. And as if you're manually doing this, if uh, you've run our installation on your Windows machine, I think that you don't have to do this at all. You definitely do get the NuGet source already. I think you also get the templates. So well, thank you, Art. Uh, so back to this. So in VS Code, we, we ran the debugger. And so that basically restored the project. That's why we had a little bit of a delay and uh, it's running the project now too. So this is the, the, the stock standard application and we have a few extra pages. So we have a report viewer and a report designer. So the report designer, this is again, the end user report designer. So this is not anything new. This is something that you're long accustomed to. Uh, and for as many years as we've had .NET Core support, you've been able to run uh, applications, web apps um, from a non-Windows environments and serve this end user designer. So this is not anything new. This is not really anything to be excited about, but it's cool that it works. And this is kind of just out the box. Um, and the other thing, again, that it's not really um, super, it's not really a game changer. This is just something in Blazor uh, is this uh, document viewer component. So, I mean, this is again in the application, but what was always missing is that if you were a developer in a non Windows environment and you wanted to edit a report, you had to actually go down to this level, open the report designer, the end user report designer in your application and build things out. Um, my guess, I, I can't imagine anyone would actually do that. My, my assumption is everyone, um, everyone would basically use Visual Studio for this purpose. So most of the time, if you were making changes, you weren't actually going to be resorting to this web end user designer uh, because unless you really are a glutton for punishment, I guess you could do that. But honestly, um, any um, person who's not that would want to be using Visual Studio. Uh, up until today or up until now, uh, because now we have an extension that allows you to do this from VS Code instead of Visual Studio itself. 
Um, so kind of heading into it, how can we kind of make use of this fact? So firstly, uh, let's go ahead and uh, go into some of the commands that we have. So all of these are prefixed with DX reporting. So we can go ahead and create a new report. Um, so let's go ahead and do that. So I click new report. And uh, I might also have to go ahead and uh, uh, start the designer before I do this. So starting the designer actually loads a config. It's an empty config, but this config has some hints as to kind of what it's looking for. So you would kind of expect that half of the reporting piece is the report definition. So the thing that you see in a RefX file or the thing that you see in a, in a class definition, if the class um, inherits from extra report, the other half is the sensitive connection strings that you need. And obviously since they're sensitive, we allow you to serialize them separately and to basically not really have the two intertwined at all if you don't want to do that. Um, so this config is giving us some hints that basically, hey, these are some connection strings that kind of reports depend on. And we don't have connection strings yet, but we're going to connect them up. And I'm going to go ahead. I'm yeah. Sorry, that question popped up. Is the report designer part of the Blazor controls or do we need to pay for the report server separately? There is no, uh, I should clarify that in backwards order. So you mentioned report server. Report server is a completely distinct product from reporting. Uh, report server and reporting components, usually they're two very different audiences. So the people that really are best served by report server are people that uh, have some familiarity with SSRS or they want to replace SSRS. So it's a fully built solution that there is no development going on at all. You're just installing the report server that we already built. It's an ASP.NET MVC website and it has a service database of its own and you're not really doing any development. You're just doing deployment and installation and configuration. Um, the This report designer is not tied to Blazor either. So this report designer is in the same sense that uh, the report designer exists in VS Code. So in Visual Studio, sorry, in Visual Studio, it's the same sense that it exists in Visual Studio. So in Visual Studio, we have a full-blown report designer that gives you the ability to basically load a RepX file and to edit it and to save RepX files. Though that's kind of what the report designer is meant for in Visual Studio. And that's what we're doing right now. So let's go ahead and head into a new report and let's give it a new name. Let's call it creatively new report and the designer is loading. And uh, actually when I saw this for the first time after using reporting for so many years in Windows and Visual Studio specifically, I was kind of surprised and shocked to see this. I've already, I think maybe yours will look a little bit different because I actually went full bore and also customized my extension already. So if uh, you go here, you have some cust extension customization options as well. So I've actually already gone ahead and cho choose or chosen a designer theme, green mist. I wanted to be creative. So that's why it looks a little bit different. But let's go ahead and, and change these settings again one more time. And you do also, by the way, need a feed. Um, and uh, that's what's going to be pulling the core reporting libraries. Um, so again, I'm going to be nuking this feed, so it's not going to be working soon. Um, so don't bother. I um, keep using nuking, and then it's also green mist. I yeah. Like there's like a. Yeah, there's some radioactivity here in this yeah. talk. So let me go ahead and change the theme on the fly because I actually haven't tried doing this, and it would be curious demonstration. So I'm going to change the theme. I'm also going to go ahead, and it looks like I've already defaulted since I'm on the pre-release version. Um, to be using the latest. So maybe let's go ahead and see if I can uh, switch to release version. Yeah, I'll do that too while I'm at it because I think that my templates right now point to the release version. So I'll switch this designer to the release version too. So the release version right now for those at home is 23.1. So if I, if I go, maybe I have to reload these settings, but let's go to settings. Extension settings. I don't know if it picked up on that fact that I changed it live, but anyway, I I'm, I am using the non pre-release. So let me go ahead and reload the RepX file. And again, the RepX file is what's going to be triggering the designer. 
So whenever you have a RepX file in your project now and you click on it um, in VS Code, you'll get a designer. And I think that I get the dark designer now because I picked the dark theme. Oh, yeah, it works. Um, and uh, I think that if I also go into the extension settings, uh, I have to actually reload it because I, I, I mucked around with what version I'm using. So I think once I reload this extension, I think it reloads my environment when I click that. But once I reload that, it should actually pick up on the fact that I said change the version too while I'm at it. So it's called it's called Dev Express reporting, I believe. So Dev Express. Yeah, Dev Express reporting. And uh, it looks like I'm on the right version that I was talking about. I'm using the dark theme. Uh, and uh, 23.1 is that version. So like I said, next week, we're going to be on 23.2. And just by not using the pre-release, you're going to be using 23.2. So we're at that weird time of the year where we're only, I would say, when we're about a month away from a release, that's when pre-releases become available. So we're at that weird time of the year, two times a year, where you can kind of make take advantage of pre-release versions. But I don't think necessarily we need to because... There's nothing I'm going to be showcasing here that you won't be able to get otherwise in 23.1. So uh, this is basically a completely blank report. Uh, and uh, like I said, since we don't really have connection strings yet, we really can't add data sources because there's nothing to point to. We have to kind of start from scratch. But uh, fortunately, we can kind of get up to speed fairly quickly. So I actually went ahead and looked through our demos and saw that we have a few uh, reports, uh, RepX files in our demos that we can make use of. So I'm gonna go ahead and create a place to store my reports here in this particular project, I'm gonna call it RepX. And I'm gonna go ahead and move the reports that I copied from our demos in Windows um, into this particular folder. So we can immediately go ahead and see what's what and how, how many capabilities we have. Um, so let's go ahead and let's go ahead and yeah, let's copy all the files in this particular folder into this one, this RepX folder. And I get these RepX files. And if I click on any of them, what I should get is I should see um, a designer um, with uh, the report definition. And let me make this a little bit bigger. Uh, and uh, I should be able to go ahead and immediately preview this and have it rendered correctly. The only um, thing that's gonna be a little bit different that you're gonna get on your machine, machine relative to mine is that in Mac OS, I've already installed, I think libjpeg libraries and other things like that. And that's, I think, because I use FFmpeg for other things on this Mac. But if you're building a, a Docker container and you wanna know exactly what dependencies you need so that you could render fonts correctly. Uh, we do go over that and I'll, I'll point to the correct documentation on that. But if I type in my nine letter last name, um, the character comb control um, should go ahead and correctly render that um, the way reporting should work. And this has always worked on Windows and it's worked in the end user designer, but now it works in the non end user designer. This works basically um, here in this environment, which is you know, the drop and replacement um, for uh, for Visual Studio. So hey, I'm, that's our office number. Yeah, yeah. I, I don't know what my passport number is, so I just decided to, to fill that rather than my social <laughs> security number. I thought that yeah, would be that, that, that would be pretty smart. Uh -huh. um, and uh, yeah, it's not a secret um, that this is our suite number and our address number. So I'll just type that in and let's go ahead and you know, this is the pre document preview basically that you get. And what is the second page? The second page is just that, okay, whatever. Um, let's go ahead and export this to a PDF. So already this is doing um, the whole shebang when it comes to reporting. This is actually not just letting you design reports, but it's letting you build the, um, the product of running a report. So I've gone ahead and it's loaded here. So it's, it's actually built a complete report already. So it does work completely. Uh, it renders. And I mentioned this briefly, uh, but you will get slightly different results if you're kind of using macOS and, you're, and you don't have uh, 
I think libjpeg and a few other font libraries. So let me go ahead and. What is it called, Arg? Libjpeg? Yeah, so I think if I go ahead and uh, we may even talk about it here in this in this particular blog post, we talk about these particular dependencies that you need to have. So um, I believe, if I'm not mistaken, this is what you the, the minimum dependencies for what we call our Skia rendering engine. And if you're at all confused about what I mean by that, in the Office File API webinar that I did on Mac OS on the same machine, the same thing applied. I was doing um, rendering using this, not DevExpress drawing, but DevExpress drawing dot mm -hmm. And uh, these in Linux, these are the dependencies that you need. And I think they're pretty similar in Mac OS. But my guess is that if you're a developer, you probably have these particular um, files already, these dependencies already. So, um, in in a uh, Ubuntu type environments, you you basically need it looks like these uh, libfont config. So you, you need these files, uh, and uh, once that's the case, you should be able to be up and running. Um, if you don't want to muck around with that, we do have I think some Docker containers here, so you don't have to guess what you're doing. So uh, if I'm not mistaken, the Docker image for um, Ubuntu is this one. And we should probably mention, yeah, these are these are the minimum dependencies. So there are a few libraries. I thought it was libjpeg. Apparently it's not, but I'm pretty sure that's why mine works because I'm pretty sure that's what I have installed. Um, but uh, basically, uh, if you are not really willing to muck around with your local machine and uh, have this working, you can just run the, the image from Docker and have it run in a container. Um, have it run in a container. Uh, now, the thing is that uh, we were kind of going over the end user designer here, and we were also going over the the look and feel of kind of the report. So once you um, are dealing with report definitions, they're actually bound to data. This one is actually not bound to data, but if you were talking about something that's like a real life report, it's going to be bound to data, meaning that you are going to get connection strings involved at that point. And that's kind of where things get a little um, dicey because developers don't like dealing with uh, databases as much as they can. They kind of like throwing that stuff to DBA and uh, they, they like having their, their SQL server instance just running correctly. And that works dandy in Windows. But on Mac OS, especially on the new silicon, uh, the new M1 silicon chips, it's less um, straightforward because um, ARM64 as an architecture it has kind of broken a lot of things that kind of worked before. So even getting um, parallel support, uh, getting virtual machines to run, all that stuff is just a lot harder. Uh, so you may not even have a SQL server that you can really point to. Uh, you may be using Postgres. My guess is that if you uh, are, have been a long time Mac user. But uh, you could still use... Um, SQL Server, if that's what you want to use. And I'm guessing many of our customers don't want to migrate to Postgres. They probably want to stick to SQL Server. But you could still use uh, Transact SQL and SQL, well, a flavor of SQL Server in your local box on Mac OS and continue to develop. So this particular demo, as you would expect, is going to be looking for a database. And it's not going to find it when I click Preview. Um, so again, I had this loaded up in the end user designer in the application itself, um, but now I'm loading it into VS Code. So if I click on preview, it's going to give me a scary error that, hey, I can't find a connection string and I kind of expect that error to be there. So it said what it can't find is this endwind connection string and capital endwind. Okay, so now that I know the name of what it's looking for, I'll go ahead and give it that. And uh, so it's called n wind connection string, I believe. I always get these wrong. n wind connection string. Okay, now I actually have to give it a valid connection string, and this is actually something I always kind of forget how to format. And thankfully, we have a great account on GitHub called Dev Express Examples. Uh, and specifically the examples that are kind of like bare bones and the, the best for this sort of thing for hooking up the databases 
I find are our old school web forms examples because we have a web config there and everything just works like it's supposed to. So I've actually already found the example or I found like the very first web forms example I could find that was bound to some data. Uh, and uh, I, you know, here I'm open the web config up and I see that the style of the connection string is something like this. Um, so let's go ahead and point to this thing. And my connection string will have to be a little bit different for a few reasons. So let's go ahead and put this in as my first shot at a connection string. So I'm expecting I have a SQL server or something like it here on my local host. And I'm expecting a initial catalog, so the database name and integrated security tree. So Windows authentication is what I'm trying to use here. Um, that's probably not going to be the case for <laughs> this application because it's probably going to be using like a network service or something like that. So it's going to be using a different service account. Um, the next thing is I got to actually have SQL Server running on my machine. And actually, if I go back into this terminal environment, uh, I've actually gone ahead and done something, uh, which is that I've um, pulled a Docker image of something called uh, SQL Server Azure Edge. So SQL Server at Azure Edge. So this is a version of SQL Server Azure uh, intended for, um, and maybe I can even clarify even more if I go here. Uh, so if you go here, this is a version of SQL Server Azure intended for IoT devices. And the reason why you'd want to use this or you would be interested in using this on Mac OS is that you don't have to host your database or point it to the cloud if you use Edge or an Edge type database or something like uh, SQLite. Um, with SQLite, you lose uh, Transact SQL. You can't do Transact SQL in SQLite. So it's a different dialect of SQL. With Postgres, you get a full database, but again, it's not the, the version of SQL you're used to. Um, so this is one big advantage. The other thing is that actually um, to get ARM support, so to get support on the architecture that my Mac is on, so it's an M1 Mac, uh, I need to have a compatible um, database that I can run, a compatible database engine. Um, so otherwise I need to run Windows for ARM and I'm not totally sure what works as of today in Windows for ARM. So it's kind of a, a hairy business. So what I've gone ahead and done is I've actually found, um, let me go ahead and just open anyway. Uh, I've gone ahead and found something called Azure SQL Edge. It's a Docker image and i am gone, gone ahead and pulled it into my Docker desktop. And I've gone ahead and provided these arguments and you can find the documentation. So there's no real surprise here. The only thing that's sensitive and kind of you're gonna be Look, having a different set of values for is your super secret password. It's going to be different. Mine is DX1998 underscore blazer exclamation point. Yours is going to be different. Why 1998? Because our company was founded in 1998. That was a glorious year that DevExpress came into the, this world and started offering ActiveX controls. It was a game changer. Woo yeah. So uh, this um, these are the set of arguments you're going to be passing in. So uh, the only difference between what I've kind of written here and kind of what you're going to be supplying is that you want to make sure this is all on one line. So this, these are basically two one-liners, but after you run these two one-liners and you start up your Docker image, you're going to be getting um, a face full of log information like this. So the log basically is telling me that, Hey, um, this stuff is running uh, and it's uh, there's no real, blocking errors and I'm already running and I started running this a while ago. Um, the other thing I should mention that I've done that's optional, but probably is a good idea, uh, is that one argument that I passed in that is uh, not necessary, but again, like I said, it's pretty great, is I have some persistence in this Docker image. So I'm pointing it to a location on my Mac machine where the data can be written as well. So it's a, a var opt, uh, MS SQL. So that's where kind of all the data gets stored. So if I make a change and I close the Docker container and I reopen it, I don't lose the changes. The changes are there. So that's why I did that. Um, now, the other thing is that we're going to be using a tool called uh, Azure Data Studio. And if you're kind of, again, familiar with using SQL over the years, you're probably 
mainly confined to SQL Server Management Studio on Windows. Azure Data Studio came out a few years ago. It's been getting progressively better and better. Um, and uh, I think it's now good enough that you could pretty much swap it for SSMS if you'd like to. Um, and it, it's kind of like based on VS Code. But the idea is that I can actually connect to um, this running um, Docker database environment um, just to verify that, hey, it actually does work the way I'm ex expecting. I've already passed in the parameters. So again, it's going to be running locally. Um, it's going to be not using Windows authentication. It's going to be using my SA account. So I don't have to worry about how the web app perceives what user account needs. So it's not going to be using some NT network service account or something like that. And just to sanity check that I can see everything, I actually do see all my databases. And we'll get to kind of what I've added because the only thing I've changed so far is this thing I call NWIND, uh, which is, as you guess, a Northwind database. So when you go ahead and take these steps, you're going to see everything except for NWIND because you haven't added anything yet. But I'll go ahead and connect and uh, here are my databases. Again, I, I'm seeing NWIND and this is kind of like the, the glorious Northwind database of all our demos. So you could it, you can run any queries against this and get data and it, it works the way you expect it to. So we have actual functioning data at this point. Uh, now, I believe that the only remaining steps to actually pull this into a reporting engine is that if I go back into co VS Code, it, I have to make a few changes. So one of the changes that are kind of critical is that the database name has to be right. Um, so the database name is, gonna, I'm going to call it NWIN because that's what I called my database. I'm not going to be using integrated security. I'm going to be using uh, a user ID, I believe. I think that's how they format it um, in connection strings. It's a user ID and I'm going to be using a password. And I believe my password is uh, DX. Well, let's, this is why I wrote it down. Because actually I built this Docker image, I think like a month ago, and then I, I kind of forgot what my SA password was and miraculously I found out kind of. So um, I don't want to forget again. <laughs> so DX1998, uh, Blazor, uh, and I think that's, that's all I need. Uh, and uh, if I go back into the preview, maybe we'll pick up uh, error when trying to populate data source, error when let's go ahead and go into a new report and add a data source because i think i have to actually reload this tab so when i reload this tab it's going to pull open the designer once again and it's going to actually allow me to add data sources now i get some options i you can see my connection strings in other words so i actually get this thing called nwin connection string and not only do i i get it but i also get all the tables and I can actually build queries. So I could visually run something we call the query builder, which is pretty exciting because you had nothing like this um, available to you. Um, if you were, you know, by hand kind of mucking around with the report definition in code or something like that. So this is kind of like really nice that you could take a table and I think that the that we have products and we have suppliers. I think that's what's kind of important. So we have products and we have suppliers. So these are kind of like the, the bare relations that we kind of care about. So maybe I want company name, product name, category name, and I want as many pictures as I can get because it's interesting how we format those. And I could preview the results and I'm gonna get actual data. So it, it doesn't try to fill this, this column with actual images, but uh, I should immediately be able to pull in this uh, this data. So let's go ahead and um, do that. Uh, this is kind of like the report template generation that kind of you're used to. So there's nothing specifically going on. Um, and uh, let's, uh, let's go to the next step here. So let's, uh, since we're only adding a data source, that's really not a visual task. So let me uh, go ahead and see if I can change the uh, the template that it's using if it's so the the visual side of this so I wanted to basically build detail reports top down um, uh, and uh, have some sort of grouping maybe by category so maybe category name since I don't have um, 
maybe even company name is more interesting because there's not that many categories. Uh, and uh, I want to go ahead and uh, have group headers and detailed bands and uh, company uh, and products. So, and I'm going to give it, you know, one of these nice color schemes as well. So kind of, it built out a lot of the report already without me, me, me having to do much. And I think I'm going to also go ahead and expand this a little bit so that this picture can fill up a little bit more space. I'm not going to bother with, with the XR image, but I think that that should do it. It's going to be relatively ugly, but it's going to work. Uh, well, it looks like it did not resize this image, so I can just get rid of this. So let's let's get these two. This is a challenge because I have to do multi-select in an environment where modifier keys are a little bit different. So let's let's go ahead and cut instead of delete because the way my my delete keys work are a little bit different than how I'd expect them to in Windows, and. Uh, I also really don't, one thing I, I like doing is, uh, actually we've already gone ahead and done it. The, the group header, I like having it um, organized so that the group header's at the, the top of the group. So here it's in the middle. So it looks a little bit funky when it comes to displaying your data because you want the the uh, field headers beneath this, this company name information. And let me go ahead and also while I'm at it, get rid of this image box as well. So let me get rid of that. believe it's okay and let's get rid of that too don't need that and let me see our properties and again this is the same um, designer that you would get if you're um, in the end user designer so this is kind of very similar to what you would see in the web report designer it's based on that and not based on the look and feel of the designer in vs code but the functionality that you get, sorry, in Visual Studio is the same functionality you get here in VS Code. So again, I've kind of sorted out that last sort of column that was bothering me. Um, let's go ahead and rearrange this because it's, I don't like having this report header here, this group header here. So uh, I think that all I have to do here is actually just move this uh, one area up, if I'm not mistaken. So I'm gonna go ahead and cut it and paste it in. That's not gonna be functioning for me, it's fine. I'll go ahead and move this. And if not, I don't really need to bother. Okay, good, that finally picked up on my movement. Let's move that here, Let's group header one. Okay, I think what is this one called? Let's find out the name. This is, look at the properties. This is our group header. Group header two. Okay. And let's again, look at the report explorer. Group header two is underneath that. Okay, good. So I think that now my report, yeah, that's kind of the style of the headers that I prefer. And I'm also gonna go ahead and do a little bit of indenting because it's kind of annoying not to have this represented kind of the way that you expect groups to be displayed. And this is just a small change I'm doing. It's not necessary, but you can. Uh, I'm gonna go ahead and also Okay, so I believe it was function delete key is what it is in Mac and that's not something you get in Windows. So that's why I had some trouble finding it. But basically now I have a data bound report. It's actually six pages. Uh, and uh, I'm actually looking at different company names. And uh, while I'm at it, let's, I guess, go ahead and uh, well, let's go ahead and export this to a PDF first to make sure that our PDF library works. Uh, so yeah, it's, uh, yeah, call it, uh, maybe report to creatively. So <laughs> report to, and I'm going to pull out this file that I just generated report to, and it's actually a fully functional PDF bound to 
the database that's running in Docker right now in macOS. Now, I think the connection string name was right, so I could actually use this in the invoice report as well. I just need to close this tab and reload it um, so that it picks up all the connection string changes. I think I named the connection string right so that this definition does work and points to the right place. Uh, well, no, it's not. And there must be some small difference. So it's I'm guessing that box. populate the data source error when trying to populate. Well, it's fine. What I can also go ahead and do is I could take a look at what our data source, our SQL data source here points to. So let's go ahead. And this is kind of the magic of having a full report designer that you can uh, live go ahead and Take a look at what you have access to and uh, okay, SQL data source one. And if that doesn't want to comply, I will go ahead and edit the report layout itself so that it just actually dog foods that connection string I wanted to be using. So this is Northwind. Uh, and if I'm not mistaken, Invoice report does point to Northwind, I believe. Uh, this looks like Northwind. Yeah, this should be Northwind. So we'll go ahead and point it there. Uh, and uh, let's go ahead and end win the connection string. So was this what it's called? So this is a, a RepX file that we have on our disk right now. We'll go ahead and do. Um, is we'll actually open into it. So I believe it was in this RepX folder. Uh, so let's go ahead and quit our editor and let's open this RepX folder. So RepX, not this, but actually RepX. And it was the invoice report. And this is the raw text version of that same report we're looking at with the, the pretty text and pretty font. And I pulled it from our, I kind of betrayed the one rule I kind of set out from the start. I'm using the 23.2 uh, report. And the reason is because I pulled this from our 23.2 demo. It's not really going to be life altering to use it, the wrong version actually. But if we're talking about three years of version differences, then then becomes more problematic. This is like a half a year of version differences. So less, likely anything bad is going to happen. Uh, and I'm going to look for this thing. Um, uh, I believe it's this Nwin connection string I'm looking for. And connection. I'm going to look for Nwin. And uh, yeah, it looks like I cannot find it in this report definition. Let me go ahead and check the bottom and the top. Okay, so what's it expecting? It has a SQL data source and it's binary data, so I can't really look at that, but let's go ahead and see what else we have. Um, let's go ahead and I'm hoping to get this RepX file working as is without really having to change much. If not, let's go ahead and edit this. So this is the query that we have in our master detail relation. Um, I may want to go ahead and, so I'm not gonna be wanting to build this query for a second time. Maybe what I wanna go ahead and do is, what if I were to take a look at uh, my existing data sources. So I have, let's see, my database have Northwind connection string as I would expect it to be. And it's fine. We don't necessarily have to muck around with the, the same exact layout and getting the same layout to work. I'm pretty sure this is just um, a naming difference in our connection string and what it's expecting to see. So let's go ahead and see if I'm getting some error about uh, the schema does not. Con okay, so this is kind of why this, my data is a little bit different. It looks like this is maybe um, a different sample database. So let's right now go ahead and look to see what Microsoft uh, sample database has something like order details extended. 
is it called that? Let's go ahead. Order details extended. Order details extended. Extended uh, Microsoft sample database. And uh, if, yeah, it's AdventureWorks. It's not actually Northwind, which is fine. We'll go ahead and do this live. So the same place that actually I got Northwind, we can actually use that to get AdventureWorks. I wasn't expecting to use AdventureWorks so soon, but it's fine. We could do that right now. Um, so this is where Northwind lives. AdventureWorks is the neighbor of Northwind. And, <laughs> it uh, lives up there. Yeah, it's right up there. Uh, and uh, I, I'm actually... It's the girl next door. Yeah, let's go ahead and see AWPL version. Let's. I don't necessarily want this, but let's AdventureWorks sample database. Let's maybe start from here. So restore the SQL Server. Um, Let's go ahead and look for a place. Yeah, creation scripts is technically what I want to be using. So I'm going to go ahead and point this to I can either download the install scripts or I can actually, I think, okay, great, even better. I get this nice set of install scripts, uh, well, TP install. I don't want data warehouse edition. Um, and I get a bunch of CSV files, but I should probably look for a SQL file that I can run and there, there's the last one. And I'm gonna be using this, um, I'm gonna have to actually create something called AdventureWorks for this to actually work. So this is another thing about um, SQL, server Azure Edge Edition that you don't, that's gonna be a little bit different than SSMS. In SSMS, you could just right click and you get the option to create a new database. You don't get that option here. So you have to actually uh, go ahead and uh, issue the, the command and valid um, T-SQL. So I, I earlier created something called Northwind. I have to create something called AdventureWorks and I do not trust myself to not typo this up. So. I'm creating a database called AdventureWorks and it should show up here once I've gone ahead and done that. So let's, uh, you know, let's run this. This should go ahead and actually build it and actually act, give me the names of my databases and my databases include something called AdventureWorks now. And if I refresh this, if I click this, I get something called AdventureWorks. So now I actually have AdventureWorks. Um, it doesn't have tables yet. I'm going to restore that too. Um, so let's, go to the, the raw version. I don't, I never, I never like looking at that. Yeah. Uh, let's go to the raw version. And uh, while we're at it, let's make sure that we line comment this. So let's comment this part. And we have all of the data that is going to be added. And right now, this is blank. And after we run this, it should not be blank. Uh, and Looks like it looks like I need to maybe even have a, a using or something like that for it to pick up on the fact that the uh, the namespace here is supposed to point to something called AdventureWorks. So let's go ahead and do that as well. Uh, it looks like it's depending on environment variables. I yeah, these are not going to be. necessarily here so let me comment this out and let me if i am expected to have this i can add it but not necessarily the case so yeah let's uh, uh go ahead and point this to the right database name um, so i believe i don't have to yeah yeah, so I'm going to go ahead and do that myself here. And I'm just going to take this part of the script all the way down to the bottom and run it against AdventureWorks. And I hopefully don't have to do anything beyond that. Let me just scroll to the bottom. Okay. Hey, Arg, we got yeah. a question on Twitch. What performance metrics do you use for your code slash project? Uh, well, uh, sometimes uh, I rely on CodeRush. Uh, so I get a few 
uh, hints in Code Rush to, to tell me what sort of performance I'm going to be expecting. Um, we also use static code analysis here at Dev Express, and so that gets applied as well. Um, that's kind of down the line, not really directly on the code itself. Like you don't get like uh, uh, the nice sort of features that Code Rush gives you in that case. Uh, mainly, I would say the thing that um, I care about more than performance itself is uh, unit testability and uh, whether or not uh, our functional tests are passing. So that's kind of the bigger sort of guarantee. But anyway, it looks like, sorry, it looks like this particular script was not running against this. So uh, it's not really a, a big deal. I don't need to have these particular um, identity. I don't need these particular data items here. What I'm going to go ahead and do instead is uh, load back into our report designer and uh, just uh, I go ahead and maybe modify um, what we have just to, to verify that kind of uh, we actually are getting um, the uh, the binary array of data that we're expecting uh, when it comes to the image column that that's kind of the, the one thing i kind of wanted to verify so this picture should be a binary array and i should be able to, to, to render it completely in a picture box and that's kind of just at least the, the last thing that kind of is worth kind of checking out and making sure it works so let's pull this in and preview it and now i should actually get images and they're not super high resolution because this is northwind data uh, but i i do get the ability to to render this and while i'm at it i might even want to go ahead and build a new report from scratch and see what we get so let's uh go ahead and again go into this dx reporting uh new report and uh, let's call this new report two And, uh, oh, by the way, one other thing I should mention is that if you click new project here as an option, uh, you do get a sample project that I believe is in Blazor. I think it's Blazor WebAssembly, if I'm not mistaken. But uh, it's not necessarily the case that you're going to be using Blazor. You have to be using Blazor with this extension. It's just that Blazor is kind of the, the de facto standard for um, new web projects when you're creating them. And let's point this to, let's say, the database. And again, the one connection string that I had. Uh, and uh, let's, again, uh, build some sort of query, run the query builder. Uh, and maybe I want to go ahead and look at what products we have. And uh, just quickly, this time, pull in more data. Uh, and I just want everything except for these ID fields are not really super great. And maybe this time I'll go ahead and uh, add some sort of idea of report parameters. So let's go ahead and point this to, um, let's edit this report parameter so that we can call it like a category parameter. So category param. And uh, I think what I can go ahead and do is allow it to be a string valued um, data. And I think that if I'm not mistaken, if I call it condiments by default, it should point to something. I think we have something called condiments in this data. Uh, and uh, I'm going to also add a grouping so that it's kind of organized and that we can see different category names. Uh, and uh, maybe I want to do some sort of aggregate analysis as well. So maybe units on order do a sum. So. Let's go ahead and do that. And let's also uh, maybe do a slightly different color. And I don't really need a header at the top. And this should actually, again, point to data like I was expecting to uh, and uh, give me a, a PDF if I, if I so choose it. So I'll call this report three. And uh, this, again, is talking to a connection string. and. It's, um, actually running a report um, by the report definition we gave it and you're getting a, a PDF back. So again, this is kind of totally um, 
separate or totally decoupled from requiring a Windows environment. So we're doing this totally um, outside of Windows. The render is happening um, in Mac OS using our Skia rendering engine. Uh, the kerning of the fonts is going to be a little bit different than what you would get otherwise. And some of the white space padding is a little bit different too. So kind of be warned, you're not going to get exact pixel perfect um, representation as you would get or that matches the old version. But this is mostly uh, something, things that you wouldn't really notice unless you had another version of this report to compare it against. Uh, and, and generally speaking, it's not going to cause line overflow issues or, or things like that. It's, it's going to be small resizing effects. Uh, let's also go ahead and since I mentioned um, having uh, a parameterized report, let's actually take the query parameter and let's make it visible as well as a report parameter. So I'm going to point this to uh, usually having a, another data source is how you go about doing this. So let's go ahead and have a data source. So add a data source of category names. So this is kind of a, a good sort of, uh, sort of uh, step through of kind of a very similar or a very common uh, scenario where people often ask, how do I build a parameterized report? Well, the thing is that if we're going to be using lookup edits or lookup fields, we want to have something that our editor is going to be pulling from. Um, so we generally don't want to have it touched or have it touch the filtered report data, because then as you pick less and less, um, or as you pick more and more um, filter items, uh, you're going to get fewer categories available to you in your pull down. So let's go ahead and add a parameter. And again, I'm going to call it, it's going to be a dynamic list and it's going to point to this new data source I added and the data member, uh, it doesn't really matter because we only have one table, um, but the value member maybe what matters is category name because I'm going to be applying strings directly as the filter. And maybe I want to go ahead and display category name here too and sort by, let's say category name, okay, alphabetical ascending, uh, and uh, report cat. Well, this parameter one, I, I could just remember that is it's a, it's a report parameter. So it's not a query parameter. This is a report parameter. It's going to actually display in the uh, print preview. It's going to display in a panel as well. So uh, I don't want, I, I think I do want to allow multiple. No, I, it's going to make my query a little more complicated. So I'm going to avoid multiple values so that we can quickly write the expression if we need to in SQL. Uh, and it's enabled and it's visible. OK. And maybe I think uh, I think by default, I should have it point to something like condiments. Why not? <laughs> I condiments I, again. I think that we have condiments data. I'm Head pretty job, sure that there's master. something like that. So if I preview this, it's going to actually say, give me a, a value for this thing. So, and lo and behold, it looks like I was right. There's something called condiments. But um, once I actually provide a report parameter value, I could submit this and get the report. Right now, the filtering isn't enabled. So we're not going to actually see any difference. It's going to be all the data. So we also get beverage data. We, we don't want that. We want to actually filter. So we only get condiments in this case or whatever we pick. So let's go ahead and go into, I believe, this SQL data source. And uh, let's, at least two queries are required to make. OK, that's the master detail relation. Uh, and the name of this table is kind of funny. But I will go ahead and uh, run the query builder and query properties. Uh, and uh, let's go ahead and add a filter expression here. So here, if I add a condition, the condition probably is that the category name on this thing, uh, if I'm not mistaken, well, if I don't have it here, I have it here and this after the join happens. And uh, this is kind of an, a, a little uh, power user tip if you're using the end user designer. Um, but if you click on this item here, um, Actually, if you click, yeah, there you get this little drop down so you can change the item. So you either give a static value here or you can point to a particular 
property or parameter. As you would guess, we don't want property, we actually want parameter. Property would be another data bindable property. So here, parameter is what we want. And we only have one parameter, so it defaulted to that, which is kind of what I want. And like I said, I picked a string value parameter so that I could directly apply it in the most simple possible SQL filter. Okay, and uh, I wonder what the preview results would give. Uh, I could get category name at the very end. Yeah, so by default, it's all set to condiments, which is what I kind of expected, which is good. So it's actually running, and I'm going to go ahead and what else is it asking? Uh, it's asking me about some details I've already set, so I don't really care. And now if I preview this, now if I've gone ahead and picked like dairy products, hopefully, well, uh, it's, it's default still to condiments. It's stuck on condiments right now. So let me go ahead and see if I get, it's always the same two pages, I believe. Yeah. So let me go ahead and go back into my designer and modify that one more time. So this is the data section of the report definition. And what I want to go ahead and do is I want to load into these parameters. And uh, I think this value is not the default value. It's actually the right the value that's overriding any of the dynamic data. So maybe that's the problem. And if I go back into preview, now it looks like it's waiting for some actual value. So I'll type in grains slash cereals. And fortunately, it again picked up condiments. So let me go ahead one more time, head back into my parameters and see what it is doing. So Who I am. condiments? Yeah, condiments are ever Who popular, I guess. Honestly. So um, <laughs> I think I don't have to make any changes here to this particular parameter. Um, so I'm going to leave these categories alone. It's pointing to a dynamic list, which is fine. Uh, I don't need to filter it either. But what I do need to do is I need to make sure, well, this is, let's run that query builder. And I maybe need to go ahead and make sure that the parameter lives here. And if it doesn't, I mean, if, if this is going to pose problems one more time, let me go ahead and remove this here and let me go to my query parameter, query properties and go ahead and see if I have a parameter that it understands. So let's go ahead and uh, maybe, okay. So let's go back into and maybe I want to go ahead and well this is the other data source so let's go back into the original data source and this is kind of the last effort if if uh if this doesn't easily let us build out what we're looking for. And let me look at the SQL just to make sure that this makes sense. So the SQL, the, the joins look correct. The category, category name is pointing to this thing called category param, which is the query um, parameter. And the query parameter, uh, hopefully, uh, is picking up on the fact that it needs to be maybe an expression uh, yeah, I think, no, this is going to be totally static if I set it this way. Uh, I maybe need to go ahead and add or remove it one more time. And if it's not going to play nice, I'm going to throw up my hands at this point. <laughs> so let's see, string, um, I'm going to just give it a, a bad value. So it won't find anything in that case. Uh, and uh, let's go to previous and let's run the query builder and let's go ahead and go to my query parameters one more time. And let's go ahead and point this back to parameters. I'll call it 
param1 and that looks to be working and uh, maybe what I want to go ahead and do is I want to make sure there is something called param1 so let's go ahead and go here oh param1 exists now and that's a great sign and I don't necessarily need uh, this thing called category param anymore so let's click move and I want to finish and the final thing is uh, in this section uh, my parameters I maybe need to set up its dependence so that it's pointing to the field value So I want something called param1 that's going to be feeding into. So take the member param1. So parameters. And uh, I see that we are looking at this filter uh, it's pointed param1. And I think that it's not going to pull anything because nothing has the uh, category called zero. Um, let's go ahead and make sure our report parameter here is aware of our query parameter. So dynamic list, tag expression. I think I got to here go ahead and set uh my expressions so i think it's called param param one let's i think pointing to itself it's uh it's not necessarily the case that i want to point it in that direction, but let's let's try one last ditch effort to get report parameters to work. It's always, okay, so the drop down appears the way I expected to. I don't think this is going to apply though. Uh, yeah, it didn't, unfortunately. So sorry to end on that note, but we got everything else working. Um, actually, there's no real functionality difference um, between uh, what we were showcasing and, and this. Uh, the, the important thing was kind of the, uh, the advanced designer functionality we kind of expected it is there. Um, so uh, really, you can already right now uh, make use of this. You don't have to wait for the release. So again, the only thing you need to make sure is that you actually have DevExpress VS Code Report Designer installed. Uh, and once that's the case, you'll have full access to this. And uh, everything should just work out the box without any real surprises. Uh, the only thing that was a, a bit of a surprise today was that in Azure SQL, um, Azure Data Studio for me, um, I found out that this um, sample report depended on Adventure Works and not on Northwind. That was the only thing right, that was right, kind of right. the big surprise. But once that is uh, fulfilled as well, uh, then uh, you will you will just be able to to function without any real difference between your Windows box and your your Mac OS machine. And of course, I also wanted to mention that the other types of data, so. If I go here to my other connection strings, uh, you can also point to something like a web service or you could um, point to any compatible uh, SQL connection string. So that's an option as well. So you could just use the the uh, SQL Azure non-edge edition if you want to point this to the cloud. Okay, so that's actually everything. Okay, we did have a question come in really early that I sort of sure. uh, waited till the end just because I thought it might take you off course. Um, is this available for XAF templates and designer for XAF projects in Mac and VS Code? So it's not built into XAF templates at this time. Uh, it's actually standalone from our templates. Uh, so it's basically purely dependent on installing the extension uh, in the VS Code library. 
And uh, once you do that, you have this accessible to you. And to be um, realistic, it's in CTP edition, which basically most new things end up in that category. And it takes one major release for us to stabilize everything. But right now, everything works and functions the, the way you would expect it to, in either the end user designer or in Visual Studio. So it's it's mostly there. It's uh, probably not going to change much, but in terms of stabilization of features, that's probably what we're going to see. Okay. And we just had a question pop up on YouTube. Hello, I'm new to XAF, learning the basics for a job interview. I see you are coding on Mac. Can I develop with DevExpress products on Linux? Yes, yes, you can. The only requirement, or, or sorry, the only limitation is that when it comes to desktop development, so if you're looking to target WinForms or WPF, you're going to be out of luck. And that's not because we have an input on that. It's just because that's where, uh, that's, those are your, you don't have cross-platform as an option there. Um, so if you're looking for desktop development, you're, you're out of luck. Uh, if you're using uh, like the .NET Framework edition of Web Forms or MVC, you're also out of luck. But if you're using .NET Core or what we call .NET these days, yes, you could use Linux completely. Uh, and if you're using something like uh, Blazor or Blazor Hybrid, you're also in luck. You could do that completely in Mac OS. So those, those are not things that you're dependent on uh, using um, either Windows or, or Mac OS. All right, cool. Um, all right, everybody. So that is it for this stream. We will be back next week. Uh, we try to keep consistent on Tuesday, Wednesdays, and Thursdays, but as always, check our schedule. And if you want to follow us, you can click on your notifications. And also that will allow you to know when we do go live. All right, thanks, Arg. Sure. And thanks everybody for joining us. We'll see you next time. Bye.